Hey everyone, welcome to Puka J Podcast. My name is Ben Van Kirkwick. I'm uh, recording this little enterprise out of um, Northern California at my place in Auburn. And I'm Luke Williamson, the other half of Puka J Productions, and I am not recording this session uh, out of Lindos Rhodes, Greece. That's right. That's We're talking uh, across the world through the magic of Skype. This is nice. We are Puka J Productions. Uh, you should come and check us out on www.pukaj.com or just pukaj.com. Uh, whatever we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. We've got all of those links up there. Um, we want to start a little podcast series. We just want to capture Luke and I talking about the things that we're out there uh, out there doing as we try to put together this documentary about um, uh, about all of the new work and the facts that are uh, that is emerging that is really affecting uh, the, our view of human history. And yeah, I'm just going to agree with that. I mean, we're you know, science science keeps updating itself, but uh, a lot of our our soft sciences like Egyptology are, are not quite so quick. We'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Yep. We've, uh, we've been to uh, Egypt. Um, a couple times. A couple of times all over various different parts from Tanis up in the north all the way down and Alexandria and all the way down to Luxor in the south and uh, Aswan. And we have uh, been to South America, Peru and Bolivia. Yeah, a couple times. And a couple times. <laughs> and I'm um, going to uh, Gunan Padang shortly here in Indonesia. And, uh, and then back to California and be doing some more work back there. Yeah, we've interviewed a bunch of good authors. We've got uh, a bunch of uh, other people lined up to do it. We're in the midst of sort of creating the content and uh, we'll, be, we'll be adding lots of, um, lots of new stuff uh, in the coming weeks. Yep. I think we, yeah, we can probably mention Brian Forster, who's an yep. author and researcher and uh, the, uh, the Commit School of uh, ancient mysticism out in uh, Cairo, the son of uh, the very famous and well-respected uh, Hakim uh, Oyan. And um, uh, Laird Scranton, we mentioned. Uh, yeah, he's coming and... up. Graham Hancock, I've certainly, we've, we've, we've traveled with him a bit as well and hoping to get yep. him uh, on an interview here shortly as well. Yep, and uh, hopefully author uh, Stephen Mailer will come and talk to us, and maybe Klaus Dona, the uh, the Uparts, the out of place artifacts guy, who's got a lot of very interesting stuff. So there's all kinds of people out there. That's that's not it by half. We're hoping to talk to some geologists as well, maybe. Yep, engineers like Chris Dunn. Yep, Randall Carson. So we'll, you know we're we're still reaching out to people, and we're you know we're hoping that that you're as interested in this stuff as as we are because. <laughs> You know, we've we've actually we're, we're committing full time to this this project because yeah. uh, it really interests us, and we think it's, you know, I, I was saying to Ben, you know, I've been I've been waiting for this document. I've been waiting to watch this documentary for so long that finally we just decided to make it ourselves. Because That's right. We're yeah. not seeing it. Yeah. You know, where is it? You know, people have their their story and they're sticking to it. One of the one of the problems with the alternate community too is there's pockets. You know, people that have their ideas and, it, you know, they hold so tight and they, you know, and, and I understand it's their baby. So a lot of times they don't come together so much and talk about, you know, the all of their things together right. and how that might present an interesting picture. So hopefully we'll be able to do that, you know, for them. Yeah, exactly. We want to give a voice to uh, all of these people that, I mean, already have voices, but often uh, these stories. And if you're really into the topic and the subject of, of human civilizations like we are, they're buried in these books and the books are great reading, but not everyone's uh, going to read all of these books. So we, we want to bring together and tell these stories. I think there's such a weight of, of a cumulative weight, if you like, of new work and new evidence that, that really should just blow the, the whole foundations of 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 the, the the house of history, if you like, uh, away because yep. I think there's all this new information and it, it really warrants a fresh look uh, at our past, at our civilization, and that's that's the story we're trying to tell with this documentary and and with our company. As Luke said, we're both working on this full time. It's a passion for us. We've yep. been you know, traveling independently for years uh, and reading and, and talking with authors. I've had the chance to meet a lot of these a lot of these guys. We've we've talked about yep. and spent spend quality time with them, talking about these things and being fascinated. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I think, you know, one of the things that we'll hopefully be able to share with you, too, is that, you know, when we go to these places, we talk to these people, how incredible it is to go to these sites with an Egyptologist and a stonemason and, a, and an indigenous history keeper. So you've got you've got guys who read hieroglyphs, you know, went to school to learn, you know, how to read hieroglyphs. And, you know, you can talk about the stuff that's written on the walls, that's written on the monuments, that's written on the statues and... Uh, yeah. You know, it's just it's fascinating. A lot of people don't have don't have that opportunity, and we're I certainly have been really grateful 
for it. But it's been so eye-opening. It's just that's right. And there's there's just so many of these um, of these interesting topics that uh, you know we want to start a little podcast series as well. Um, as well as, as producing this documentary and all this other media because we certainly find it entertaining talking about these topics. Uh, we've talked about them on trips and, and, and with lots of our, our, our fellow friends and, and travellers that have been on these, these trips with us. So hopefully this podcast is, is entertaining. We're going to certainly be posting some more of them. So, so sit back and enjoy a, a discussion. Uh, Luke and I talk about a, a number of these, these topics. I guess I, I think we should probably just introduce ourselves and... In in uh, if, if we were to, to explain kind of how history gets made, how the, the house of history gets built, if you like, um, mm-hmm. how would yeah. you do it for that person? I mean, talking about, I mean, I, for me, it's, it's the fact that history, we sort of think about things now a bit more globally. We're connected. We're used to that. History isn't really, doesn't really get built that way. Uh, if, if anything, it has these very specific domains of, of expertise and they often don't consider other domains. So, you know, Egypt and Egyptologists have their specialities and their version of, of history, if you like. The same sort of thing applies to the Greeks and the Romans and then South America is its own, is its own picture. Um, you know, and one of the, the things that is, has been happening in this space is that there's so many other, um, I guess, discoveries, new work coming in from parallel fields that aren't necessarily anything to do with those specific domains yet. You, you know, they, they definitely affect them, like things like the discovery of Gobleki Tepe in Turkey, um, mm-hmm. understanding of, of comet impacts and, and things that have happened in our past. That has a that that should have a huge impact on, on these versions of of history. But, you know, rather than drawing conclusions, I think mostly uh, what we should be doing is looking at this new evidence and understanding, we, you know, how do we how do we how do we take what we know and, and apply this stuff to it and open up our perspective and take another view of the past? People are presented with a a fact or a, they're presented with a story in, a, mm-hmm. in these textbooks that you read in school today and you know we kind yeah. of you know, obviously it's, you can go a lot deeper and go to university and there's this, this narrative that's been written when you look at the history of human civilizations and some probably something else to point out is that our focus and I guess what we're looking at here is really the very very roots of that you know, what we're looking at is how do we determine kind of the story and 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 this this little moment in time that, that, that generated humanity because we've been here on this planet for a long time. We've been here uh, a lot longer than certainly we've had advanced civilization. If you look at the fossil record, um, it's clear that humans have been here 200,000 years, potentially longer, 300,000 years every time they dig something mm-hmm. up and do more analysis. Yeah, in our, in our, in our current form. That's right. So human, so, that, homo that, that sapien, really is, sapien, yeah. That is, you know, one of the important questions is, is that why is that uh, if you say 200,000 years, for example, why is it that we, you know, spent 160,000 years in exactly the same state, um, not uh, changing or not, uh, you know, expanding or learning and just repetitively doing the same thing over and over again. And then well, yeah, no suddenly 37,000 years ago or something, you know, we, we start to... Uh, you know, you know, start doing crazy stuff and, and okay. progressing and then, and then, you know, coming out into... Even then, it's you know, a slow progression, right? There's some cave art, but we didn't actually develop things like organized agriculture or, or society as we would consider it today. Anything organized beyond like a Neolithic Stone Age um, really didn't happen until about 10,000 years ago. As you say, we keep updating our own sort of frame of reference and, and, and our fields in, in a lot of these scientific disciplines... Um, and although history and these things isn't particularly a, a scientific discipline, I mean, it's not a hard science, you can't do experiments and get results in the same way you can with physics and chemistry. But, you know, we, we've had a viewpoint that's really been set in stone for a long time. Like it probably right. was, was more or less and hammered out 100 years ago or so. And this, this updating of our view and the story is, is, is not moving forward in the same way that a lot of other disciplines are. And this right. is the thing. There's so much new evidence and new work that the people haven't stopped digging People haven't stopped doing um, uh, experiments. You, you've got guys redating the Sphinx. You know, Robert Schock, uh, Boston, Boston mm-hmm. uh, University professor, um, looking his Sphinx dating uh, uh, theory, the argument against that uh, being that there is, you know, if that was 10,000 or 40,000 or even older um, uh, monument, then clearly there must be some other things uh, in the world, and there aren't, so they they sort of pushed his theory back, and then the German Archaeological Institute digs up Gobleki Tepe in uh, in uh, in eastern Turkey, and there you mm-hmm. go, it's been carbon dated to about ten thousand uh, years ago, and it, it it's it's a giant megalithic site, and sort of correlates, you know, throws throws out the Egyptologists' argument against um, against uh, the redating of the Sphinx, but 
the story doesn't get changed, right? It can, we, they just, it right. gets ignored. So oh, it's it's, ignored. It's, easy, it's, easy, it's easy to do. Yeah. You've already distracted people from that. Right. But I think, you know, the story, the story of Gebekli Tepe is, is nowhere near complete. I mean, they've, again, they've dug up like maybe 5% of that, of that site. I yeah. mean, there's so much of that stuff they know is still there, but already they, you know, they're telling you it's a, it's symbolic. It's a fucking temple. You know, it's, I mean, we don't know. We're so arrogant in our, and we're so quick to come in we're just hasty we're yeah. hasty we're a hasty race it's you know a- we come in we want we want to think we already know what it is and we're just we need to we need to stamp it right away so that nobody gets uncomfortable or has a moment of i don't know what this is it's a te- don't worry people it's symbolic it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a temple yeah I think you know, there's, there's there's an element of that that that, that comes with the acad- academic mindset i think because this is you know, history is it's a it's a it's a woven story around a bunch of things that we we these facts mm. and these artifacts and these sites that we look at. Right? It's an interpretation of a bunch of of, uh, of writings. What comes down to us in books and writings and in indigenous knowledge, although that also often gets ignored. Um, but that's the mindset. These these the academia ac- academic uh, folks who I guess control the story, at least control what goes into the textbooks and is taught at universities. They're very tightly attached to that story um that's all of their personal power their position their authority probably their sense of 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 worth is really tightly coupled with this particular version of history because it's you know it's not a hard science then they're experts at this story in some ways it's it's similar to to you know i guess uh theology school right it's it's, you become an an expert in this story and you and your sense of identity is tightly woven uh to this idea and this story so to some extent, you can kind of understand um, the, the the need for these guys in a lot of cases to declare all mysteries solved. You know, I've got the answers. I'm an expert. I can interpret everything. Um, certainly, nothing in a, to see here. Yeah, right. Nothing to see here. And in, and in an age where, you know, you, you talked about information and, and and being tightly controlled in the past, we're not we're not in that age anymore. Now you've got the internet. You've got right. you've got YouTube. You've got people throwing all sorts of opinions and theories around all over the place. So. Uh, these guys don't they can't remain silent on this so so the the natural position is to defend this story and do so aggressively by sort of stating that i've um, this is the answer this is you know i'm the expert and in a lot of cases you've seen in like the zahi huas attacking hancock when he in that false debate we were both at in egypt last year i mean this is the reaction it's it, when you question the story you're now questioning that person there yep. you're, you're somehow questioning their integrity you or you often get you know, just an angry response. It's hard to debate it because it's somehow seen as a personal affront on these guys, and 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 that's the sort of reaction we see, uh, unfortunately. You know, and it's I mean, it's pervasive in you know in in pretty much study of all ancient cultures. I don't, there's a there's a very uh, good book um, which uh, uh, called Breaking the Maya Code yeah. by a guy called Michael Michael Coe, who's a professor professor and. Uh, you know, he talks about how, um, you know, the Maya historians and uh, the academics um, involved in the study of the Maya. I mean, up, really up until something like 25, 30 years ago, they were fucking, excuse my French, they were absolutely adamant that uh, the Maya hieroglyphs were just were primitive art that had no real meaning whatsoever. It definitely was not language. Right. And it took it took a long time to figure out how they were, you know, expressing themselves and what you know what they were saying. But we figured it out. And and now those people who for literally forty or fifty years uh, they held back. I mean, they literally suppressed, crushed, ridiculed anybody who tried to even work on it yeah. or suggest that it was actually a language. And these were people who they were giants in the field, and now they're never even mentioned because they were wrong and they were insignificant, and they they held well. They were significant only in that they held back, you know, the uh, the progress of of understanding, right. which is you know what you know academia should be about is understanding, you know, reaching an understanding and continuing to move forward with it. Yeah, there's there's an open mindedness that's certainly lacking, right? That's that's the whole point of what we're trying to do here too is, is is not so much to present like here's a conclusion that somehow I'm I'm attached to or some story that I'm I'm invested in I mean the the, the point is is we we should be more open minded in this we need to take mm-hmm. a, a look at all of the evidence and not just dismiss it because yeah. it somehow thre- it threatens a story or it's 
you know, if it do, if 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 the facts don't match our conclusion, we discard the facts. That's right. that's so exactly. often what happens in 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 history, and there's so many examples of it that you know need to be explored. And and you talk about uh, knowledge not going. I mean, now you have scientists and engineers and 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 uh, you know tradesmen and people that that really understand precision and manufacturing. Uh, going to Egypt, guys like Chris Dunn has been doing this through the 80s and or the 90s, and has done incredible work analyzing um, some of these artifacts. And you know, the Egyptologists, there's really no no explanation for the things that come up. I mean, you just have smoking gun after smoking gun uh, examples Wait, of, of incredible precision and and advanced machining, and typically always in the oldest, the very oldest layers of what's out there in Egypt. I mean, this stuff could, uh, can't be explained by the, the traditional story. They, they, could, they, they could just rename the Cairo Museum the House of Smoking Guns. It really is, yeah. You can, you can wander around in there and, and you know, every time you go and spend a day in there, you'll, you'll find a bunch of stuff that just defies explanation. Yeah, I mean, and this, 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 is, this, is, uh, this is an easy way to sort of examine kind of what's wrong with uh, or, or at least one of the hugest, big, the largest holes in, in, um, in I guess the the orthodox story of of Egyptology, and that you know if you assume that okay the ancient Egyptians built everything, they built the pyramids, they built all the massive sort of 70, 80, 100 ton granite boxes in the Serapium, mm -hmm. they built the the two, three hundred statues, a ton statues out of granite of Ramesses at Luxor. Um, let's just assume that happened. The, the the confusing thing about that is is that somehow somewhere that uh, you know the, the age prior to the the old kingdom right you've got the old kingdom middle kingdom the egyptian civilization was, was yeah. running for about 5000 years but at the very tip of that in the old kingdom the first few dynasties before that you have what's called the archaic age or the you know almost a neolithic period they, where people they, were assumed to yeah. be um, you know just scratching a yeah, living out of pre dynastic caves into, pre dynastic age and, how is yeah. it possible that and and all of these the largest monuments the you know the the assyrian at uh, at, at, at Abydos, which is just a massive underground megalithic temple with, with you know, straight precision cut edge blocks that weigh, you know, dozens and, and sometimes 80, 90 tons. The, the, uh, the, the, the valley temple in front of the Sphinx with giant mm -hmm. limestone blocks, all of the pyramids at Giza. It's the same, the, the valley temple next to Menkara. With, yeah, with all of these things is, is that they're all attributed to the Old Kingdom. So you have to then assume that mm -hmm. somehow out of nowhere, out of a, a pre-dynastic Neolithic Stone Age, Click your fingers, and and here is the Egyptian civilization. Not only at its very peak, it's you know it's they built peak. their biggest monuments. They well, they, they did they all of like their the... artwork, and then somehow it just degraded over time. The next five thousand years, because they never replicated uh, that that level of work in the Middle Kingdom. I mean, this is not how civilizations. It's uh, it's a problem go. because because what they you know what they like to say, you know, and what the the Egyptologists will say to that is they'll say, oh no no, like there really was. They started off. You know, pretty crappy in that first dynasty, and then they came up to their peak by the fourth dynasty. Yeah. And and the, what they don't like to mention is that those dynasties, first through fourth dynasties, are actually very short. The fourth dynasty in particular, I think, is only like 70, 80 years, something like that, and the rest of them are like maybe 200 years. Yeah. And they're very, very short dynasties. But you know, there really has to be before you have a long descent. There has to be an ascent, well, that's like how at the we fucking work. beginning, and then there's there's just no real example about that. But you 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 run into you know problems as an Egyptologist when you know I mean you could start with with the Step Pyramid of Zoser, which you know it's not a pyramid, it's it's a series of mastabas that are stacked on top of each other to make the appearance of a pyramid. But it, it's he's a it, this is the first pyramid, right? This is the one that is it's the father. It's it started everything off. It's what they say. And, and it's at least you know four and a half thousand years old, and yet you go underneath that and you find forty thousand plus jars, bowls, cups, all this pottery and stonework that's underneath there. Yeah. And a lot of it's in the Cairo Museum. We've seen it. We've videotaped. We've taken pictures of it. You know, this stuff is made out of everything from you know alabaster, which is quite difficult to you know work with without it you know, uh, cracking or, yeah. or, or splitting if you're not working at a really high speed, all the way up, you know, through the most scale till you get to all this stuff that's, you know, made out of granodiorite that, you know, how are, how are they doing that? No, and then all the way rock, up right? to the granite, right. granite diorite all the way up to... And, and then, and all the volcanic rock, and then you get, yeah, you, all of a sudden you start finding this stuff that's, 
you know, comprised largely of corundum, yeah. you know, which is nine out of 10 on the most scale, the scale of hardness. So you know, diamond works. being a 10 That's right. Yeah. and, uh, you know, Brescia, corundum. yeah, Brescia, uh, Porphyr, the Imperial Porphyr, uh, all of this stuff is extremely hard. I mean, you would, I think, you know, if we, if we talk about regular steel, that's something like a 4.5 to a 5, I think, on the most scale. If you're talking about hardened steel, you're still only like in the 6 to 7, you know, range. All of that rose granite, if you used hardened steel on that, you would just go through your hardened steel so quickly. It would be hilarious. And, and yet, look at all the stuff that they've got. Look at that, uh, look at that pillar. Well, they're perfectly that formed jars. I mean, you just do these are the jars. Let's not move off the jars just yet. I mean, they're... they're there are dirt jars of all sizes from tiny and small to, to, mm -hmm. to large made out of these substances sitting there next to pottery yep. stuff, all labeled pre-dynastic. Yet it's, it's all perfectly it's all attributed, form, perfectly yeah, it's all attributed to the yeah. to the Nakata civilization, right. which is one of the, the earlier uh, pre-dynastic civilizations. And, and it, yeah. you, you do, you've got those Brescia bowls and even that, that one corundum bowl and it has like a it has a handle they have two handles on the side which are really sort of artistic handles often I mean, with a hole through the handle and then yes that's what i was going to say that you've got a hole through these tiny little handles and that hole is like a little bit larger in circumference than like a a, a knitting needle not a knitting needle like a sewing needle some and so yeah. like how how in the hell are you you know show me the stone with the turning mechanism on it that you used to drill because wow. that's what they, they'll say You're they'll say oh out. we took these bowls and and you you know you uh you know you, you attach a stone to the bottom and then then you have like a little mechanism on it and you one hand goes over the other and it spins that stone and it cut i mean it's not cutting it's just, it's, like that. It, it's ridiculous yeah and not not only that but the interior spaces right that's the most amazing yes. part of these bowls is that they're hollowed out on the inside and then how do you carve those and there's lips and space. There are some bowls yeah, in that, and and, some and the jars. And There's some yeah. alabaster jars in the museum that are so thin they're translucent, like light passes mm -hmm. through. I mean, this is not a, this is this is hard to achieve today. Certainly, making jars and interior spaces out of granite uh, and corundum, and and even even things like. Yeah. Um, uh, well, like uh, we conglomerate. Wouldn't... I mean, there's there's stuff yes. that is impossible to where you take a conglomerate stone, which is basically a, a mixture of all types of different stones of different levels of hardness. A lot of, a lot of flint. You flint yeah. in it, it makes it very difficult to work because as you run saws across that surface, things explode. Makes it very and it chunks. Yeah, it makes it very hard to have any kind of consistent Yet, you know product. The the biggest the issue where we we come to one of the the other the other big issue with I guess Egyptology. And we can move on to Peru maybe as well, but uh, it is that the way that these things get dated, right? They don't, Egyptologists mm -hmm. do not, in the story, they'll tell you, I mean, they do not date things by their manufacturer or by trying to look at the, I guess, the engineering of the thing itself. How they date them is they date them by where they were found and if mm -hmm. there was any writing on them or writing done Right. around them and so you and know, if there was any organic material well there's know, always the, the near them too. right the, the way carbon so, dating but that doesn't you just you know, tells you the just, last person to build a campfire in that place that's ex all. exactly it's yeah, that's exactly what it is like you have a bowl that you really like that was given to you you know you die it's buried with you and then it became you know it's dug up oh this person we can date this bowl to these remains but yeah. that bowl may be thousands of years old yeah, yeah i mean and, and and this is the this was the eye-opening example of that for me was the was the Serapium. So you go into the, the Serapium for people that haven't been there. It's, it's, I'd you should go there. It's Egypt right now. It's amazing. There's nobody there. It's it's a great time to go. It's safe. You get, it's you get, actually it's it's a horrible time to go because it's so hot. But it's well, a great time to go because everybody a is terrified of terrorism and b don't, don't go it's so July fucking August, hot. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, go in the I winter. Mean, you know. 2016, 17, great time to go. But this the Serapium is, is a hollowed out, massive series of tunnels. It's hollowed out of the bedrock. Uh, I think it's up near Dasher. And it's they're inside in these alcoves off to the sides of these tunnels and also in the in, in, there's actually one. And, and, yeah, there's actually one uh, in, in a hallway as well of these massive granite boxes. And they're, they're somewhere they weigh between 70 and with the lids up to 100 tons, so 30 ton lids and just incredible precision uh, engineering and manufacture of these boxes. There's been lots and lots of analysis done on them and written about them. Yet, yet there is uh, that none of that those factors and and looking at the precision of these boxes. And we can talk, we could talk for hours just about the Serapium, but none mm. of that is used in how they're dated. And the way they're dated is that if you go to one of the boxes in the very end, it's one of a couple that have some writing on it, some hieroglyphs sort of chiseled into it. If you some could even call scratch. it that. 
and it's it be, yeah you go down and look at this and there's you know that's it's it's chicken it, as you say chicken scratch whereas you can tell it's been hammered very poorly yeah. into the side of this perfectly you flat can tell straight they, surfaces. None of, none of the lines Chips are straight. Are missing. Yeah, they none of the lines. They are can't straight. make. You know they're probably yeah. they're using to me it's obvious they're using the best tools they have sure. to try to to make you know a, a clear indentation in the stone and you can bear you can't even see it it, it I yeah. mean you can see it but it doesn't go down more than like maybe a millimeter half millimeter in the oh, stone it's, it's, the all, of, are, all of the yeah the lines, of the are, lines are are, are uh, jagged and scratchy they're not straight I mean it, it honestly looks like something like they let a child practice on is yeah. is kind of like the effect it has because but there's no way if you have the ability to carve out the interior of those stones with the lovely right angles uh, or those boxes and make a lid for it and polish it to the the that sort of buttery smoothness that, that reflects light almost like a mirror like a black mirror if you can do that then you can carve hieroglyphs in the side there's, there's just no right yeah, and you don't have any the, problem doing that. And that's the issue with that is is that this is considered the box with the writing on it that you can go down and look at, and you mm -hmm. can look at this chicken scratch, and it's obvious to anyone, as you say, that, that this is not whoever did the writing on this box was not remotely using the same technology that was no. used to create the box. All the tunnels the box are in, for that matter, There's... which whole, moving the box is a whole other thing. But the what 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 the Egyptologists do is because that box has been written on, and because there's uh, there's some shems and some names on there, not to mention there's an empty shem on there too, but because there's a name on there that associates it with a specific dynasty, I think it's it's a, a Middle Kingdom uh, association um, there, there's a, the name of Middle Kingdom Pharaoh, they date not only the writing, they date the mm -hmm. box, and box they date the empty. cavern system as well yeah. to that to that uh, to that to that pharaoh. To that so there you go. And now you know, this is and all you know what Kingdom, and you know what I would say uh, if they analysis. actually said if they actually turned around and said, we don't really know, but there's some writing on there from the Middle Kingdom, so we know it's at least that old, I would go, you know what, that sound, that's reasonable. That's a reasonable thing to say. Well, that, that's you can say, we don't really know how old it is, but there's something in there that's Middle Kingdom, so it's at least that old. Yeah. Then well, you could go, wow, that's kind of interesting. You know, Why don't we just keep uh, an open mind and keep thinking about that? But, but before we go on, or I, I want to go back to the writing on those boxes, because yeah. there's other problems with the writing on those boxes. I think there's three of them in there that have... Uh, hieroglyphs on them, and there's the one at the end that has that's absolutely covered. Yeah. And then there's two others in there that have like a, a sentence, pretty yeah. much, and that's yeah, it. Something on the front. And one of, one of them, it's very interesting because one of them has uh, a sentence, and it has you can see it, it's got the what what you said, uh, which is the correct thing, uh, the shen, the shen ring, which is what most people now refer to as a cartouche, cartouche. which is which is uh, just for people who who don't know this stuff, which is where either the name or and this is the thing: Are they names? Are they titles? Where the name or the title of the person or you know being is inside that? Anyway, so th there's there is a shen a shen ring in in one of these um, sentences that's written on the box, and there's a problem with it because in ancient Egypt, when you were writing, if you were mentioned a neter, which we think of as their gods, but I think they thought of more as like a, a force of nature but if you if you mention like for example if i wrote the sentence today where the word comes from osiris and i went to the beach it, you would actually write osiris today and i went to the beach you would do that out of respect for the net hair so instead of today osiris and i went to the beach it would say osiris today and i went to the beach that's how they would write it we there's endless examples of egyptians putting the net hair at the beginning out of respect. And that box is not like that. It literally says, like, today Osiris and I went to the beach. It's been written in the correct form hmm. to our minds if we were reading it. But that's not how the ancient Egyptians would have written that. So who, right. you know, at what point, who carved that shit? Yeah, it's uh, that's right. I mean, th that's it. The problem is, is if they admit this, it's kind of opening Pandora's box with uh, with everything. Because once you you get your you go to the Serapium and get your eyes open, that clearly, he who's well, he who he who yeah. hammered chisel, <laughs> and whatever it was he was trying to use that barely scratches this thing wasn't using the same technology. Then you go yeah. and you look at you go to the into the museum and the whole first floor there on the bottom. You walk straight in, go straight forward, and you just are surrounded by sarcophaguses and boxes and ben ben stones and statues and 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 you look at these things and it becomes apparent that 
almost all of these things are exactly the same as that box in the Serapium. You can clearly yeah. identify. See it time. You can time clearly and identify what the the precision and the polished surface and the finish of mm. of these objects. They were just beautiful, uh, absolutely beautifully precise and. All of these, you know, and Chris Dunn looks at the, he, can, he discusses precision, but then you look at the writing that's on all of these boxes and it mm -hmm. all displays the same. You're definitely carved. And, and some, of it's, fine, some of it's fine work. I mean, this is why it's, it's, it's in the Egyptian you Museum. See. Some of that stuff is really fine, but clearly not the same as the techniques or technology used to create these things. And it's yeah. almost see, on everything e in that museum. You see every, almost every single example of those boxes in there, that the box has been created and finished and polished to a high degree before the writing goes on the box. That's and if right, you're yeah. if you if you're doing it all at the same time, you know you're gonna you're gonna make the box, you're gonna carve into it, and then you're gonna polish it and nice. finish it, you yeah. know. And then it's all done and it's beautiful. And instead, that's that's not what we see. And 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 it's obvious as you go through. I mean, Ramses the second is possibly the greatest example of it, and his son Meren Ptah, but there, I mean, there's a ton. There's a, they Put they were all at it. They were all at it. They all went and claimed earlier monuments. That, and there's yeah. So maybe that's absolutely a... no absolutely no doubt that yeah. there were a, a large amount of stuff that had absolutely no writing on it that you still see lying around, but that was then claimed and had writing, you know, all over it. And yeah. then people turn around and say, oh, this was created, you know, in the time of Ramses the Great. Yeah. All of a sudden, he's Ramses the Great because he wrote his book on him on everything. Yeah, it's, I mean, so that, that's that's a good point. So that's the this is the the argument, right? So remember back, I said that Egypt. This is how Egyptologists date everything is by the writing. Yeah. They don't consider the manufacture of these things. So you know, trying to admit that would be like admitting that there's a there's a there's a damn good possibility that the ancient Egyptians found these these sites mm -hmm. just as sacred as we do. Uh, they found the objects just as mysterious, and probably they even they may have been connected to whatever culture mm -hmm. originally built them, yet lacked the capability to, to to replicate it. Maybe they, who knows? But it's quite likely that they then claim these spaces and use them. Certainly, that's what we do today. Right. I mean, we still yeah. find these spaces just incredibly sacred and and special. Um, you know, so there's there's lots of this evidence, and this I actually think that's a great example. Is that the Egyptians certainly wrote on everything they could, right? They put their name on stuff. Um, the best example that I and I'm going to make a little video uh, about this specifically is that there's this black statue. There's many of these beautiful statues yes. and mm -hmm. and and uh, carvings in in the museum, and they're just usually typically out of granite or you know just just a basalt, right? a beautiful yeah. black stone, fresh, fresh yeah, yeah, igneous yeah. or volcanic rock, and you can feel like there's this one statue in particular where it's the typical sort of it's a black statue, and there's a person sitting on a box or a throne, half of it, yeah. the top of it's missing, but you can from the chest down, it's all there. And they're sitting on a box, and you can fit the beautiful finish. You can rub. You, if you touch it, you mm -hmm. can feel the, the striations of the ribs at the at the top of the chest. You can feel yeah. the bones in the legs and the muscles. It's perfect. And they're sitting on a box, and, and on the side of the box is carved <laughs> a, a lotus flower motif. Right? It's clearly contemporary yes. with the box. It's not. It's not symbolic language. It's not hieroglyphs. It's this lotus flower motif, and it's all detailed. It's wonderful. And around the top lip, like around the top sort of three inches of this box. Yeah. There's hieroglyphs. It's, there's, and there's, there's, a, there's a cartouche with someone's well, name in it that's, that's like right. slightly off kilter. Yes, <laughs> and, and well, and you can look at this right. And although it's it's very good, like it's detail, it's it's deep. I mean, the best pieces get put in the museum, right? So this is right. clearly a craftsman that's done this. And you can see the hammering marks. You can see how it's been chiseled out. The the problem is, even though it's nice writing, you can tell it's completely different. But when you look on the interior spaces, so the, where there's a bird, a symbol, uh, one yeah. of the birds in in the writing, in the interior space of that where the wings are, it's not polished. As you can see, it's been chiseled out. It's not this, and it's just. You, and you would wonder, well, okay, what did they not polish out those interior surfaces? They obviously did, because you look at the lotus flower motif under it, it's got yes. indented surfaces. All of that's perfectly polished. You can look and feel right. the nipples on this statue, the interior, like the lines that, that separate the nipple from the rest of the chest, the insides of the toenails and fingernails, all perfectly polished, unbelievable. And, and this stuff just repeats itself across almost what all I, of Egypt. So it's, it's, it's what pretty I clear that they found this stuff. And A lot of those older... And a lot of them, you, you'll find those statues in Middle and New Kingdom rooms right. because they've got Middle and New Kingdom names on them. That's right. But you, you look at, if you actually spend enough time and you look particularly at the seated um, uh, statues, mm. if you look between their heels where oh, they're right. seated, yeah. you'll, 
you very often see tube drill marks. That's right. And yeah. if you look at the side, like underneath the butt cheek, if you will, you know, where the, the butt touches the, the seat on the statue, on the you will occasionally, the yeah, or the inside of the elbow, you will occasionally see where some kind of saw or, you know, power tool, tool has pushed you just a little bit too far. It's gone just like a two or three millimeters too far. And it's clearly, clearly some kind of uh, saw mark. Yeah. But it's, it's very thin, it's very precise, and it's gone a little bit too far into very, very, very hard stone. And, and that's a characteristic that is that only happens with power tool. Like if you were doing stuff by hand, this is this is something that's been made right. clear by stonemasons and, and people that actually work with these tools. You do not do overcuts like this when you're doing things by hand or with manual like horsepower coming from people. This is a, as you say, a rotating power saw, something that's powered, something that is powerful enough to remove material quickly enough that you just, you know, as you say, little meh, and there's these the evidence is on statues, it's on lots of these sites, and, and it's conveniently ignored, typically, or it's, or it's explained with yeah. copper chisels and copper tools that are copper just chisels. kind of <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, and has been, you know, the, the copper chisel theory is, is probably not even worth talking about just because it well, you know, gets honestly, so repetitive one of, and boring. It's one of, I think, my favorite memories of Egypt was, uh, was that April, before, just before I met you on the Hancock experience. Yeah. Um, Sitting up on it on Yusuf's balcony, which you know, I mean, it's right across from the pyramids and the Sphinx, and you know, it's it's almost like a better place to see the the Sane Lumiere show than oh, than yeah. you know the actual Amazing. seating area, and uh, and sitting there with Yusuf, and they're talking about you know they made this tomb for great Cheops to protect him from death. And you know, Yusuf sit next to me and goes with their magic copper chisels, and I just, I just lost my shit. And you know, and he's like, so yeah, they, oh, well, they built that to uh, to protect him from death. How did that work? How'd that work out for him? Yeah, right. You know, when they were building that, yeah. Let's let's just mention that for a second. I want to, because this is just so ridiculous, and I think a lot of people don't know this. I think I think a lot of people want to believe that the pyramids were tombs that they were built in a relatively short period of time, that, that you could build one of these structures in a person's lifetime in order to be his tomb. And, and the reality, I think, is just very different because there's so many things that go into it. First of all, and I'm just going to run through this like at a, a high speed, but first of all, you have to plan the building. So that takes you know, a certain amount of time. And, and these, these pyramids are not uh, stacks of blocks on top of each other to form no. a pyramid shape. That's not how these things are done. They have internal structures. They have internal uh, devices. They've got rooms, chamber shafts. They're incredibly all precisely aligned with the incredibly, you know, true right? It's there. They, whoever was building this yeah. was using pi. They understood the golden ratio. Sure. They understood all. The they they knew all this stuff. It was not. It was not a mystery to them. And so you've got somebody who's planning all that stuff. And I'm just not even going to spend time talking about how amazing that is because it, it really is amazing. Well, but 3,000 block structure as well. Three, oh, sorry, 3 million three, block structure. 3 million, you gotta yeah, write somewhere that. between 2.4 to 3 million. Someone had a hell of a blocks, CAD right? drawing somewhere, right? For sure. <laughs> Someone spent a lot of time figuring that out. Yeah. And so you, the problem is that, that you know, some of this limestone, a lot of the limestone is relatively local. Some of the limestone is not local. It's coming from somewhere else. And all of the granite is coming miles. from somewhere else. And, and and before, actually, before I even continue this, I, I want to say when we were talking about the, the pre-dynastic and early dynastic Egyptians, the Orthodox Egyptologists will tell you yeah, because they understand that we didn't have the tools according to our current history timeline. They didn't have the tools to cut those granite blocks. Yeah. So what they will say is that all of those granite blocks that were used, the Egyptians found lying around. Well, and, and this is again, that's the official story. I just right. want to mention that. Yeah, and that's, I just I, let, let me throw one thing in there on top, and then get back to that pyramid. It is and the, the way that they determined that is be, it's it's taking the bad with the good because the the whole story and the way that they explain away how these box blocks were carved and everything was moved down the Nile is because there are drawings of it and there are pictures of it in in certain you know uh, or tombs right. and whatever they reference those drawings and say, see clearly this is how they move them. There's a guy with a little a hand a copper chisel this is how they chiseled them what they don't right. have is any evidence of quarrying or any 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 stuff like that that's why they can't say that they quarried because they didn't record it now and, and, it's and ridiculous you know, uh, to think that we, these blocks were laying around but that's that's just this, it's another problem with how they interpret i would stories. like to i would like to suggest 
that uh, some of these, like the like the causeway outside, uh, you know, Unus or Winnie's you know, pyramid, Winnie's causeway, all this stuff where you you see, um, and in some of these other places where you see the um, the tools that they claim that they used to yeah, like, to make this stuff, I I would like to suggest that quite honestly, uh, a very good reason for this is, and there's some stuff, the soft stuff you can do that way, and the smaller stuff you can move in some of those ways. But I would like to suggest that, that quite a bit of that, the Egyptians were not stupid, quite a lot of that I have a feeling is propaganda because you've got other countries coming in all the time. You've got, <laughs> yeah. later on, you've got the Greeks and the Romans, oh, sure. and they're looking, they're looking at these columns that are 300 feet high, they're one piece, they're made out of red granite, they're perfectly circular and polished. Yeah. Like to a high degree, finish. and the Greeks are going. Wait a second, How we make columns, this? but we have to like make like a foot high part of the column, Rounds. and then make the next, and then put the next foot high bit on top of that, and then put the next foot high bit on top of. It. If we want, we can. How the hell did they do this? Oh, you know, well, we just, um, you know, we use these magic copper chisels, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and and so I think there's a certain part Floated of it. Floated like, the blocks just... down from Aswan one time a year. <laughs> Once well, a year, yeah, this, when is, the this is the problem. I think a lot of people don't understand this. You've got granite. It's it's 900 kilometers or thereabouts that you've got to come from Aswan. So yeah. the the only realistic way that you you're going to drag that stuff across the desert is is to bring it up the Nile. Yeah. If you're going to bring that stuff up the Nile, you can't drag those. I don't, first of all, if you're quarrying <laughs> blocks of that size, you can't quarry from the edge. We, we, we can come back you, to Aswan if you want to finish the pyramid off. But uh, yeah, well, this, this, this is, is all no, no, stuff all is, this, over the this place. This is part of it. Yeah, this it is. is but yeah. this, this is part of it is that, that a lot of the stuff that went into the pyramids and a lot of stuff that went on the outside of the pyramids, because they don't like to talk about the fact that the third pyramid and the second pyramid were, were granite cased. mostly encased in red granite that right. also came from, from Aswan. Yeah, and the so other you've thing, got the all in, this stuff. The inside of the Great Pyramid is all granite for people that don't know. The whole interior granite. structure is these massive granite blocks. Massive. It's unbelievable. Massive granite blocks that we still struggle to understand how they were yeah. put into and position. They came from today. Aswan. And they came from Aswan. Where they couldn't and quarry them in that time. Where you, you can't. <laughs> You can't where they where they didn't have the tools to quarry them, and where you cannot you cannot quarry blocks of that size from the edge. No. You have to go into the center and dig down into the core of this vein of whatever rock it is that you're digging out of, and that's where you get the perfect non-fractured yeah. pieces that massive you can pieces, arb yeah. and then massive pieces, and then and then with your magic skills remove your magic pre-dynastic and early dynastic skills yeah. remove. And you get them down to the river, and well, so you have to get these pieces down to the river because the Nile, right, is you know rises and well, floods massively once a year. Let's go the so step have, before that. Let's, get... let's go the step before that, which is you're talking about a granite mountain next to the Nile, and you're digging a nine meter hole in it to get to granite that's down there. Nine meters through granite, about uh, there yes. to get to the solid stuff. You then you cut a piece off. You got to lift that thing up out of the hole, out of the nine meter hole. Right. And this is so you 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 start to understand. Why Egyptologists say, oh, well, really, they just found these beautiful, large granite pre-shaped blocks lying around. Yeah, and then they finished it, them, right? Right, and <laughs> with, then with they just kind of... stones. With, yes, and they're copper chisels. So you've got to get these things out. You've got to drag them down the river in time for the one low tide, or for the one rising of the tide. Yeah. So you catch the low tide, you get all this stuff down there, High you tide. put these massive blocks on, no, during the low tide, you've got to get it down there, and you've got to get That's it right. onto yeah. to whatever you're going to float it on, and then and then the high tide, the waters rise, and theoretically lift, you know, the boat, the boat floats, and then you paddle that shit, you know, 900 miles. kilometers, yeah. right, up the Nile, <laughs> to, you know, to Cairo, and then, then you get it off, you know, and then you drag it up there, and then you you position these things inside, you know, the pyramid. And so, how many how many of those blocks, you know, can you move? Once a you know, year. in once one, once a year, you have one shot a year to move as many of those, get as many of those floated as possible. And the key question so, here is, is according to Egyptologists, the Great Pyramid, and I'm not sure about the, all of the Giza plateau, but certainly the Great Pyramid is said to have been built in 20 years. 20 years and sometimes you'll hear them hedged to 40 years yeah, even that so if, if if you yeah so if you if you do the math on on it and and somebody has like you said had a hell of a CAD program and they estimated that as close as they can figure is about three million blocks in the Great Pyramid and, and the second pyramid's not much smaller finished and so there's uh, I did did some math yesterday well my calculator did some math and in in 20 years there's 10 million five hundred and twelve thousand minutes and so if you divide that by 3 million uh, 
blocks. You you are putting one block into place every 3.5 minutes. And so if you want to go 40 years, you're putting every block into place in seven minutes. Seven minutes. That's and if you block. go any longer than 40 years, you're outside of the lifespan of a pharaoh. You're well outside the lifespan of a pharaoh well, because right. you're you're not you don't you're not pharaoh day one. I mean, some like like. Tutankhamun, etc. You know, were young, were kids, 10, 11, 12, when they became pharaoh. But most pharaohs became pharaohs at like 20, 20 something, yeah. some even later. Okay. So how long do you really have to build your tomb? Because something like that is going to, I mean, drain the resources of your nation. It's going to drain your workforce, oh, whatever you're doing. National I mean, it's a massive, it's nas as Zahi Huas will tell you, national project. <laughs> so if, if you start building this thing and then you die, you know, uh, yeah. is it still going to be your tomb? Is it, where does your son have to finish that yeah. before he gets to build his own tomb? Yeah. How many how many lifetimes did these things really take to build? And if if it took two hundred years, three hundred years, what is it being built reasonably for, right? to build one of those structures? It's no longer being built as a tomb. It's something else entirely. And then then you can start looking at the fact that yeah. all of these intact tombs that were found, sorry, all these intact pyramids that were found there. I'm doing it. Uh, had no bodies in them. They, you know, they, some yeah, they never some things may have been later repurposed as tombs, ones that had so already I, I been broken into. And, that, yeah, yeah. I think I think and um, then resealed. That's but. right. So I think uh, there's a there's a couple things to to suggest here. I think uh, one is one is that if you go with the idea that the Egyptians sort of inherited all these places, much as we do, and they found these monuments and things like the, the and the really megalithic stuff, like the most of the Giza plateau, likely was pre-standing there for a while. Certainly the Sphinx and probably the the pyramids. You know, we didn't crack into those pyramids until the 11th century or something like this. Uh, it was, you know, Mahmud, uh, um, yes. Mahmud's hole. It's, it's he, he. There was a, uh, I think, a Persian right. uh, king that did eventually figured out to hammer he was around. A, yes, he was a caliph, a caliph, and he hammered around the uh, the granite plugs in the front of that thing and, and managed to get into it. Now, there's a reason why I think those pyramids we didn't get into them, and there's a reason why there's no writings on the inside of them. It's because the Egyptians didn't get into them either. What I think right. we find in any place that they did get into, and this is certainly evidence in. I think a lot of the original structures in the Valley of the Kings were probably uh, megalithic structures. Um, certainly, you've got you've you've got examples of this in places like the Serapium, uh, and and lots of the other caverns where the, the walls are plastered. Unas's pyramid, for example, the walls are plastered over, and they're full of hieroglyphs. There's no hieroglyphs, no writings, no nothing like that inside the uh, yeah. the Great yeah. Pyramid. I think that's the reason is because they probably weren't getting in there to write on them. I mean, no. And I, um, I have a feeling that that you know that. You know, Winnie's or Unis's pyramid. I have a feeling those pyramids too. I mean, I think yeah, I sure. think they were there. I think the well, Egyptians it, got into them and painted and carved that that's stuff what in there. I'm saying. Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. And I think that it's quite likely they built on top of them, or they they you know because the pyramids there could have been constructed. It's really the the subterranean part of it that maybe yeah. uh, well, the original a, sort of um, you know primeval mound thing. stuff comes from. Yeah, it's a very interesting thing to to look at the Great Pyramid. If there's any way that we could really. Uh, actually look at the structure you know underneath because we we haven't really come up with a way to really see what's inside the entirety of the pyramid no you know, there's, yeah there's, pro there's, we there's have, we're, people we're having like, a lot of problems with that i mean and we're yeah. working on it and if the egyptologists will ever let them completely do it but yeah but there's, it's it's a very interesting thought the that there spaces. may have been a, a massive construction that was there that was not entirely a pyramid shape and, and that the egyptians that the, the egyptians then came and built you know, a pyramid shape around. I'm not. I'm not closed off to that. Particular well, it's. I mean, it's just. It's really. It's a. It's. It's. There's lots of evidence that suggests maybe it wasn't. I mean, the, the Giza plateau is incredibly nuanced, as as Graham Hancock likes to say. It's that is likely people been working and digging and building there for 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 a lot longer than even the Egyptians have been there. So well, who knows? Very hard to tell. You can't date stone. But it's, what, what? It's a quarry site. I yeah, mean, if yeah, you if right. you look at it, right outside the second pyramid, well, across sure. across you know on the wall there is. There's the name of of uh, of a, a man, and it, it gives his title as quarry master, and so I was like, well, what quarry are they talking about? I thought they were talking about the guy who was in charge of you know the quarry, the stuff that was arriving from the quarries, and right. no, that was that was the quarry. They were quarrying the Great Pyramids. They've been quarrying that site for well, thousands sure. of years, and, even and when even when Budge and Petrie and these guys yeah. were showing up and looking at the stuff. There were 200 caravan trains that were coming in a day. Removing stone from that site. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking about they, they, they it's been quarried. Certainly, it may have been being built for of like for thousands and tens of thousands of years as yes. well. Who knows? It's hard to say. Yeah. One thing, one thing I would say about the pyramid is, 
is uh, is is that the, the response you get when you you do look at all these these factors and you ask the question and it's typically and this is you know this is well documented is that you get back is and typically Zahi Huas is kind of the champion of this response which is oh it's a national project and and by that yeah. meaning that the whole nation got behind it everybody everybody supported everybody the workers in. it's all about the beer and the blankets and 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 keeping workers yeah. happy and everyone took their turn to do it and and that somehow just magically explains away all of the 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 precision yeah. the the alignment like you said things That's, like the planning yeah. of it the cad drawing that national project meme you can you can you can take it and look at something like going to the moon right so the, the us and russia in this big space race and technology race in the 60s and it's and and we did a national project it was everyone you know that in terms of national budget and everything got behind like the whole country was behind it and this thing got achieved now it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a case that the national project says we got everybody in the country together and we all collectively just threw some people at the moon right because it, it, we got all this manpower in 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 you know the 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 the, the couple hundred million people living in the states no there was technology involved there was planning there was high just a, a rocket science, literal rocket science involved in 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 sending those people to the moon and you know the same you know you can't say that it's a national project and that's all it takes to get that done there's 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 clearly technology and other things involved in it and the same thing applies to to the great pyramid right it's 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 a it's a even if it was a national project and those types of construction projects often might need to be it does not dismiss the need for as you said highly advanced planning uh all sorts of um transportation and and, and quarrying and and precision and putting that thing together aligning it to uh, to true north all the things that you can you can go and look at the at the at the great pyramid um it's just you know it's a huge achievement and it's it's something that stands that stands uh stands stands alone today right it's something we've never replicated interject in there is that this is that's when zahi was asked okay because they will tell you the egypt will tell you that the you know the egyptians they weren't great astronomers they didn't they didn't use the sky they looked at the sky to, to tell stories but you know they didn't they didn't use it for navigation really or anything like that right um but you know so when he was asked you know okay so how how did they then align you know these monuments these structures so perfectly so closer to true north than we were able to do in the last 50 70 100 years you know with our almost modern techniques yeah. um and that was his answer it's it's a national project everyone came together and and when everyone comes together anything can be can be accomplished that was literally his uh, almost verbatim his his answer and that so that is the scientific answer of of Egyptology and that's as closely as they're willing to look at it and which means they're really not willing to look at it right they're they're just wanting to dismiss it and you you run into the same same the other technique that they use not just in Egypt but in in South America certainly uh, I you know I ran into this personally but um, oh so you don't think the Egyptians did it oh so you don't think the Incans built this you must think it's aliens you must think it's Atlantis <laughs> right and when you so when and I got that reaction just saying we both did. How, how did how did the Inca how did so how did the Inca build this? What technique did they use? Oh, they used every technique. Oh, so can you explain to me what those that every technique was? Because I mean, honestly, how did they move this stuff over all those mountains and shape it and cut it and bring it up here and, and align it with all this stuff and and you know how did they? Oh, yeah. oh, so you don't think Incans did it? Uh, you must think it was aliens or you must be stupid. I mean, when we when you I, I was terribly ill that day and, and couldn't go, but. That was, from what I have listened to the recording, that was the first thing that Zahi Hawass said at the, the foot of the Sphinx, yeah. is I don't, read, I don't read any of these alternate theory books, but if you do, you must be stupid and you must believe that aliens built everything. That's right. It's, a, it's otherwise known as a, as a straw man argument, logical fallacy. People, it's, it's easy technique to engage in, and it's, it's the first defense often uh, for people that don't like um, being shown evidence that's contrary to that, that historical story. It's like, okay, well, clearly you're a woo-woo aliens and and you know this was a landing pad sure and you, know, you just you dismiss it you can try and tar everything uh you know with with the same brush and then and then push it off it's um that's that's often the defense and it's uh you know it's it's it, uh, yeah it's it's just a ridiculous uh line of argument it's not actually a debate but that's typically the response you get is that all of a sudden uh you're taking something away from me so i'm just gonna say that you're you know you're i'm gonna attach you to this silly idea and call you dumb and just dismiss it and you know, and the sad thing is, is that 
I mean, you know, the Inca, the Inca were an incredible agricultural culture, among other things, and they built yeah. a prolific amount of stuff in a in a difficult area. Well, um, you know, high altitude, you know, a lot right. of mountainous, uh, you know, hard areas to farm, and they were, it, they accomplished a lot. But um, you know, it it doesn't take it doesn't necessarily take anything away from them to say that some of this stuff they inherited, and the same thing with the Egyptians. I mean, I, I think you know, I think that. Well, you know, I think that quite honestly, people, you know, like Graham Hancock, who I, I greatly admire his work, but other people too, you know, I think they're quite right when, when they say, you know, we, Graham Hancock, he pretty much coined, you know, that phrase, you know, species with amnesia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because, we, you know, there's, there's a massive gap in our, in our history, in our memory, and all of our cultures all across the world have, you know, the, the flood myth, the flood memory, the flood legend. You know, there's, there's a lot of similarities in all of these places. I mean, and you look at Pumapunku, you're at 14,000 feet up there, and you have got these incredible blocks and wall pieces and roof pieces, and they're strewn about and buried in mud and just strewn about and sticking out the side of, of excavated banks yeah, and, it's crazy. you know, with stuff four feet below it and three feet above it. And it's just like somebody tossed Scattered. like a child's toys yeah. you know around and then you know i mean so what what happened at fourteen thousand feet that there was a massive wall of 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 mud and who knows you know i, yeah, I think that this this planet is not it's not this comfy sweet stable place that you know in the last five thousand years we've come to sort of think of it as you know I, I i think you know there are meteor strikes and there are volcanic events and there are sun events and other catastrophic events that greatly affect the life on this planet and we see you know wide-scale extinctions but you know if you think of 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 I, and you've talked a lot about how hard it is to actually form a fossil and you think about uh you know, massive walls of water and, and flooding techniques and other stuff that comes and, 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 and just wipes everything away. You know, you're not going to form, you're not going to form fossils. People say, well, where are all the remnants of these civilizations? I mean, uh, until they found Gebekli Tepe, they like to say, you know, there's nothing. But, you know, I, I'm still telling you, I mean, there's at least in the Mediterranean, there's something like 250 cities that we know of that are underwater. And then you get off the coast of India, sure. there's all kinds of stuff that's that underwater. was... That's, cities that are they're under they're, they're still trying to ignore and they're gradually sort of having to admit and people say well we know about this stuff why haven't we you have to understand not only archaeology is a relatively new science but marine archaeology Brain i mean how long yeah. how long have we had scuba tanks how far can we even get down as humans with with scuba gear it's a couple you know, hundred, 150 feet about you're not going to get a lot further than that for a lot of time i spent 20 yeah a lot spent 10 or 15 years diving it's um yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's a brand and new so, thing. Which maybe, and then you've, you've, got, you've got massive amounts of sediment that's yeah. going to settle over stuff. Yeah, it's a, mir you know, it's it's a miracle a for fossils to, to form in the first place. And maybe this is a good point to, to sort of talk about that, you know, this, this idea that, that uh, you know, we have these, these um, big events and the, the sort of end-of-life events, if you like, or these, these cataclysms that occur, whether they're supervolcanoes or whatever happens. I mean, these... This is something that Graham Hancock's exposed in his new book, Magicians of the Gods. I mean, really well that there have been, you know, been lots of work done in paleoclimatology. There's peer-reviewed papers running around that talk specifically about a period of time that's 10,800 years or 12,800 years ago called the Younger Dryas yes. event, yeah. and it's all played out. You can go and just search for Younger Dryas uh, event, and you'll see the 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 particular telling graph is one of the ice core samples they pulled out of Greenland. It's a temperature graph, and it shows that for you know, a thousand years or eight hundred so years, about you know twelve thousand eight hundred years ago, something happened that just plunged the world into this super deep freeze. And and through all this work of these t multidisciplinary teams of scientists, they've they figured out that you know these comet impacts and these massive impacts happen a lot more frequently than we previously thought they did. We we sort of knew yep. in most people's minds, you know, there's going to be this Yucatan event, the thing that we know. You know, they discovered yes. in the last 30, 40 years that this is what ended the dinosaurs sort of millions of years ago. Right. So we were thinking, you know, maybe this only happens every few million years. Turns out, no, it, it happens much more frequently. And one of the biggest, the biggest thing to hit us in, in, in about the last million years happened 12,800 years ago. And this was the event that, that got rid of species, the little megafauna that used to, uh, that, that lived here. So think of saber-toothed tigers and uh, woolly mammoths and all the large pigs and the really and a lot of the megafauna. 
That's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, the megafauna, and this is what 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 smashed all that off the planet, and it rose. And you talk about underwater cities. It's an event that within a couple of weeks rose the sea levels around the world 150 feet. I mean, if not more, and it, it, it blacked out the sun for hundreds of years. This was a true cataclysm. Yeah. If you were on the surface of the planet, you weren't having a good day. Uh, in that context, happened, things I mean, things like Cappadocia and Derinkuyu and stuff, and and some of the stuff things. you see out in 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 yeah America, uh, North America, it's a, there's there's a period where humans lived underground. Why would you need to do that? Yeah, right. Why and would you need to live underground? It's it's you know certainly if this type of an event happened today, you know we don't have anything in Hollywood that really approximates it. Even with these Cataclysm 2012 and these movies that show a big tidal wave hitting hitting New York or whatever, that's not. That's not. That's you're talking like hypersonic, like impacts that that melt mile thick glaciers that within days, and if not hours, is you know just billions and trillions of tons of ice and rock and glaciers that are just you know this is with these glacial erratics you find them scattered all over North America. These just billion ton boulders that that have come down and been dropped there by glaciers. And when this when this comet hit that that northern hemisphere, I mean it seems likely that. That and this is Randall Carson's work talking about the Brett's flood and, and all of the the evidence for this up in um, up in uh, Washington State. It's uh, an area called the Scablands, and you can see this path that this that this flood from this impact of the of the massive ice sheets that covered uh, North America and Europe at the time, as it just ripped its the whole Earth clean as it came down. I mean, these tidal waves and this this 150 feet. Uh, sea level rise would have created just in amazing tidal waves that would have wiped surfaces clean. And if you weren't drowned or crushed by this flood, then you were on fire from the air bursts that basically toasted the surface of the earth mm -hmm. and is and is shown also by a black mat layer uh, across rock and, yes. and basically half the world. So, you know, you're a sea and it's the middle of an ice age. We're coming out of an ice age. You're probably, let's, let's assume there's a, a global seafaring high technology civilization. You're living on the coasts, you're living on islands. You're living in the equatorial region of the planet. It was a lot colder back then. Um, these are the places that just got hammered. These are the places that would have been completely wiped out. And as you said, you, you would have had to go to places like, uh, like, like um, uh, Cappadocia and, and these underground cities, maybe even the Giza Plateau, and, and try and survive yeah. through you know just tens of generations while the sun's blacked out. And then you know you lose your memory. Let's let's imagine that happened today. And we were wiped out completely within a couple of generations. You're going to be telling yep. stories around the campfire about plasma fucking TVs and and the amazing ability of we could send we could talk into this thing and it appeared across the other side of the world. It's magic. It's and no one would not remember the technology, the details. No one, not only would no one It'd really remember magic. it, no one would fucking believe. Three generations <laughs> down, no one would even believe you. Yeah, electricity. You know, and, is, the, and yeah. the only thing, the only thing that's going to survive, the only thing that has a chance of surviving, as far as structures are concerned, is stuff that's made out of large stone. That's right. You know, anything, anything that we make now steel, that's made out of steel concrete, and, and concrete, and cement, and all this stuff. A <laughs> couple hundred years of, of that. extreme conditions, Maybe and all that stuff is just is just gone. Yeah, what you'd have left is the megalithic work of the ancients, and you'd have shit like the Hoover Dam and and things like the Panama Canal, right? To stuff, the massive work that. Maybe you'd imagine that in thousands of years when another technology right. manages to get their shit together, another civilization gets their shit together enough where they can right. develop technology and understand to get to a point where they can look at something like the canal and go, holy crap, somebody dug a trench between the oceans. Can you believe this? And they put gates in it, whatever, right? There's, right. There's, and then, it and then they might even claim that... Years. And then once they've been there for a thousand or two thousand years, they might even claim that that, that they built that. <laughs> yeah. They, just, yeah. they might, you know, start writing their name on it. Right. You know, this we is we built happens. that. Yeah. And then a couple thousand years later, somebody else finds it and goes, "Oh God, they built this!" And yeah. like, you know, that's forty-seven hundred eighty. I mean, you have a, a respected geologist. I mean, I, I, I know he, he's at a Boston University now or whatever. I think he, you know, he got his degree at MIT, if I recall. I mean, he's, you know, he Dr. it took Robert serious Doctor Shock. Yeah, it took serious balls. To come out and say no, you know this this monument is older than our our current version of history. Yeah. And then he's come back since then and gone. You know what? I was really nervous to say that, and I think it's not just older. I think it's more like thirty thousand years older than our current version of history. And as yeah. soon as you as soon as you start looking at that, and then you think, okay, well that's been there for for how long? Yeah, you right. Know, I mean, it's a it's a problem. Yeah, it's a we, problem for academia. Yeah, and and I think they could, they we really do. It's it's unfortunate that that these guys are so attached to these stories because it it get really gets in the way of people opening their own minds. I think because it's like we can't admit there's any mystery here. I mean, let's look at right. the facts. We've been human beings 
for hundreds of thousands of years on this planet. We've we've had a, we've only had civilization and technology for about 10,000 years, and we've drawn a straight line from you know, 180,000 years and nothing, then 10,000 years of incredible progress. This is not how humans work, is it? Is and 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 that progress happens to start immediately after this gigantic event that wipes the Earth's surface clean and and right. basically wipes it all out. I mean. Can you, have you heard of any, are there any ancient legends about floods maybe? All right, so well, that's it. Thanks for listening. Um, that's that's the end of the first uh, Puka Jay podcast from Puka Jay Productions. Um, hopefully you found it entertaining or enjoyable. Any feedback, please feel free to reach out to us on Twitter, on Facebook, um, or info at pukajay.com. There's um, lots of ways to get us. Uh, love to, if you've got topics that you want to hear us talk about or anything like that, I'm happy to do it, but we'll, we'll probably put these out yeah, on a semi-regular basis and just have us talking about certain things. So, and uh, Just topics address in- any... Address any complaints to Ben. Yeah. Any praise can go straight to me. That's that's that that that's probably how it'll go anyway. So. <laughs>